Hello, Sharon. Hello, Katie. Uh, welcome to the Chawton House Lockdown Literary Festival and thank you so much for taking part. Um, just <laughs> we'll do a, a proper introduction. So you're Sharon Wright and you have written this fantastic book, Flunomania Bells, which I read for the first two weeks of lockdown. Um, fantastic escapism from, from all that's going on at the moment. Um, and we came across Blunomania Bells and the, the story, uh, the stories within it of the Lady Aeronauts because it's part of our current uh, temporary exhibition, Man Up. Uh, you came to Chawton for a very different purpose um, and ended up explaining um, this fantastic hidden story of the first women who who went up in the sky um, is in hot air balloons and it's it's a story that is uh, for us has been a, a complete revelation it's not something that any of us were were really very well aware of uh, this story of, of the the first uh, the first lady aeronauts how did you uh, begin to to uncover these hidden stories well, it's a story that no one's aware of. And it, that was the, the great discovery when writing my book, is that nobody had ever brought all these amazing women's stories together. And the story of flight is, is told almost exclusively through the male pioneers. Well, there weren't just one or two or three of these women. There are 35 women in my book. That's not all of them. I first became interested in this a long time ago when I was a cub reporter in West Yorkshire, where I'm from. I'm from Bradford and I worked in Keithley. And a ghost hunter came to the office saying that he's been contacted by the spirit of a lady aeronaut. So I was sent out with my little notepad and pen and my ponytail with this chap <laughs> and discovered um, the story of Lily Cove, who've got a postcard there off, very high tech. <laughs> <laughs> and She'd been pretty much lost to history, even though she was a really big deal at the time. She came to the Howarth Gala in 1906, Howarth, of course, the home of the Brontes. And she went up in her balloon wearing her scandalous bloomers. She was an incredibly charismatic showgirl and very skilled at flying. And then there was an accident in the sky and over the moors, she became detached from her parachute and she fell to earth and she died. And there was lots of mystery about why that had happened. There was a huge inquest. There were questions in the House of Commons. There was a, an editorial in the New York Times. It was an absolutely massive cause celeb. And the whole of Howarth uh, gathered, a bigger crowd, the last biggest crowd, a crowd as big as that had been for Mr. Bronte, Patrick Bronte's funeral. Really? Yeah. yeah. And they all, they, there was a subscription and they had a lovely gravestone put up to her memory. But I always found that a fascinating story. So made my career in journalism, but years later, when I wanted to A, start in writing plays and B, writing non-fiction books, I remembered Lily Cove. So I went to look into her story and discovered that actually she was at the end of this extraordinary era of female emancipation in the sky which started in the 1780s and went right up until the First World War. So actually Lily is the last chapter of my book. And this um, image that, I've, uh, that we've just put up is, is from, uh, from Howarth and from that, uh, the, the advertisement for her parachute descent. Because um, the first day of her parachute descent was cancelled, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and they couldn't get the, the hot air balloon to inflate. Um, and that which which almost makes it the, the, the double tragedy, and that's that is the the funeral sheets that uh, for that for the huge funeral procession that you just that you just mentioned. Yeah, well, that was all part of the mystery. Why had it been sabotaged? There was the rumours of um, a love triangle between her, her manager, and the wealthy son of one of the mill owners. There were all sorts of scandals and rumours, and it was a great mystery at the time. So yes, the balloon didn't go up the first time. You were only ever about. A an inch away from a balloon riot. If people got drunk and didn't see a balloon, they would riot <laughs> all through the world, <laughs> riots. So Lily was very aware of that. And she was a really sort of sparky East End lass. And she said, don't worry, don't worry, we'll do it again. And then she did go up and then this happened. So yes, yeah, those yeah. were the funeral cards that they would send out to invite people to the funeral at the time. It's very sad. She was only 20. But her story, I discovered a lot of the time and during researching, but I actually found 
some really startling facts about her early life and why I think she took to the sky, ran away with the flying circus, really. <clears throat> her father was a convicted sex criminal. He had a string of convictions against young girls and women. And they started, when I calculate, she must have left home about 13 to go into service. So I think there's a real dark past she was on. She escaped, really, and she went on the road with Captain Bidmead. She had this exciting life. And it just came to this tragic early end. Unlike, very, oh, it's this issue. Very much in the tradition of um, women who 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 were showmen or show, show women, um, performers, um, because hot air ballooning, what ballooning was this performance, um, and certainly, you see, you go back to to some of the very early lady aeronauts. They are similarly young and similarly um, from the stage, and that's how we how we get to the remarkable Mrs. Sage. Absolutely, it was obviously there were there were women involved in the science and engineering aspect of ballooning, but it was it was nine ten show business. It always was, and you couldn't fly a balloon unless you got people to pay to come along and see it. So they were constantly huckstering around trying to raise subscriptions and turn it into an absolute showbiz phenomenon. These were the biggest crowds ever seen on planet Earth before that used to gather for the first balloon ascents. And actresses were, were just starting in the late, in the early 1780s to have that kind of pseudo respectability, weren't they? They were allowed a life outside the domestic sphere. So they were the obvious choice of women to be the pioneers to go into first balloon ascents. So in Britain, I mean, there's a long, hilarious story about trying to be the first English woman to fly but we'll just cut to Mrs Sage because you don't get much funnier than that do you? <laughs> so Letitia Sage was um, part of that Georgian theatrical world of the West End she was part of one of the big theatrical families she was invited by Vincent Lunardi who was a young Italian aeronaut to become the first English woman to fly and this was a huge feather in anybody's cap Everybody was trying to be the first person to fly an English woman or a lady, as he kept saying. Several <laughs> <laughs> poor women who tried to be that pioneer and were done a terrible disservice by various men who treated them like so much ballast, really, when the balloon wouldn't go up. So when Mrs. Sage stepped into the balloon basket in September 1785, St. George's Fields in London, she was not getting out again. <laughs> she was the first woman to fly. So there was her, there was Vincent Lunardi, there was a young gentleman called George Biggin, who was a lunatic, young scholar and um, scientist. And then Lunardi, who had failed to get three women, three people to fly in an earlier disastrous attempt that had been absolutely pilloried in the press, suddenly decided two, two more people could come along. They must have paid him. So there's five people. The balloon won't go up. Mrs. Sage, by her own admission, weighs 200 pounds. So the heaviest person there is not getting out. So <laughs> by one, they're all fun, including this other woman who she's furious about. And she refers to in her memoirs as a lady whose name I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> she was going to be the first English woman. <laughs> so there's this huge kerfuffle. The bloom won't go up. The crowd's getting restless. They've already had one debacle. The inches from a balloon riot. So Lunardi says, right. I'm just going to let Biggins and Letitia go alone into the sky. And they rise up. They're throwing kisses. It's a triumph. Letitia is the first woman to fly in England. And then she has this extraordinary adventure where they fly across London. They fly right over and end up crash landing in Harrow, where a furious farmer is about to um, remonstrate with them. When the headmaster and boys of Harrow Public School come racing over the Bradley Hill, rush down to this act beautiful actress is just falling out of the sky, carry her off in triumph. And then um, she gets home and she's absolutely fated in the press as for her courage and her grace and her absolute example, really. But then the rumour started to fly. She, became, she started to realise that when, as she says, she stooped down, bobbed out of sight to relace a curtain whilst George held her by the shoulder, and she thought people thought she'd fainted, but that was absolutely the least of the rumours. And for 200 years, she was always suspected of inventing the Mile High Club, really. 
Oh, as soon as men invented balloons, they started taking bets on whether you could have sex in one. There was this awful, charmless bet in 1785 in a, a drinking club in London, Brooks's, that where one lord bet another lord a certain amount of money for the first time he had sex, let's just put it in the pre-watershed terms, in a balloon. So these two things conflated, and there are an awful lot of very rude satirical drawings about Letitia at the time. Uh, talking about her weight, you know, making sort of lewd doublets about her balloons <laughs> rising and falling. I mean, it was so prone to doublets. Nobody I think I might have one of those here. Yeah. Um, the uh, but, This sort of charming depiction. The sage lady. Yes. <laughs> so that's very subtle, isn't it, in every way. So there's um, Mrs Sage. And her en bon point, if you put it. <laughs> That's very <laughs> true. <laughs> and this is that placed um, lamppost. <laughs> there's, always, there's always this um, myth, I thought, that she'd then gone to ground in shame, and she absolutely didn't. I was very keen to put her extraordinary achievement in the context of an astonishing life, like you say, in the Georgian theatre world. And she had all sorts of adventures after that. She was she was resilient and she was gutsy and she was glamorous and very charismatic, I think, by all accounts. And she wrote her own account. She wrote a memoir of her adventure. And it's the first time we have an absolutely full account in the woman herself's own words about this achievement. And it really was a historic achievement. It's, and she writes it immediately, doesn't she? She yeah. um, So whilst it's all fresh in her memory, this isn't, I mean, many of the lady aeronauts wrote about their experiences, but hers is, you know, she she does it in the in the immediate aftermath. Yes, yeah, she twisted her ankle in, in, the, in a way. Yeah, she twisted her ankle in the crash landing. So she laid up and she wrote to, we think it's her sister in Liverpool. And it's just, you can just sense the adrenaline and the thrill and the, a sense of achievement and fame because she was absolutely being fated. There were parties everywhere. People met her when she got home to Covent Garden. She was being carried aloft. And I mean, she's an actress. She loved this. <laughs> <laughs> and she uh, is featured in our in our Man Up exhibition, which you can which you can see online um, whilst we're whilst we're closed for the for the uh, COVID crisis. Um, no, she is by no means the only big character um, who is <laughs> part of the, the, one of the lady aeronauts. My personal favourite is Mrs Graham, partly because she is, fan I don't know if she's fantastically accident prone, it's just that she did so many balloon flights yeah. and uh, seemed to be so uh, charmed that um, every time she did successively hit chimney pots and uh, roofing tiles and uh, sort of take up, uh, take out masonry across Kennington and parts of Surrey. Oh, don't forget that. <laughs> she did, yeah, no, she did. Um, when was her she, point? She, no, exactly. But she, I mean, she she flew into her 50s and flew, must have flown dozens and dozens of times. But she's a fascinating character, isn't she? Even the, the way she starts to be, uh, her career as a lady aeronaut. She's astonishing. And I think even if you know nothing about balloonists, you might, you might have slipped it into your line of view at some point. One of those pictures at Vauxhall Pleasure Grounds of the stripy balloon and the lady with flags. And that was her. She was an absolute superstar of the sort of late Georgian and mid-Victorian era. She was really famous, never out of the papers. And like you say, because we love her, don't we? It's seen in context. <laughs> she did make literally hundreds of very successful flights. She was a very talented and skilled aeronaut, but there's no getting away from the fact that she had one very high profile disaster after another. <laughs> so, um, how, how long have we got, really? But, I mean, one of the most famous was in 19, 1836 when she took the Duke of Brunswick um, aloft to this very sort of swish party in a, a garden in London. She had a velvet cloak, a silk hat. He, apparently, by his own admission, wore jewel-encrusted underwear. I don't know if he had it on that day. <laughs> he was. Uh, I suppose if you've got it, when else are you going to wear it? <laughs> and if you have to tell people, what's the point, I think? <laughs> <laughs> but he was known as a, as a very dandified, exiled despot, really. He's not a nice man, but he's very rich. So 
he, she took him up, they went to loft. There were certain comments made at the time that he looked a bit pale as he went up, but he held it together. Now, whether what he did coming back down was a subject of debate, because when they came back down, he stepped off too quickly. Mrs. Graham, then someone steps out of a balloon, it shoots back up. She's hanging on. She's pregnant with her eighth child. Goes Small back. detail as well. <laughs> She tries to let go and get back into the basket so that she can release the, the valve to come down properly. But she, her feet are outside and she literally falls to earth where she's taken for dead. She's taken off to a farm. Her husband comes galloping up to the rescue. The Duke gets very preoccupied by where his umbrella and his belongings are, which is immortalised in the, in the press in a poem saying, you know, poor Mrs Graham hovering between life and death, but... Who wears the Duke's umbrella? You know? <laughs> and then they had this almighty spat in the press about. He said he absolutely did not step off, and he did. He lost his bottle. He stepped off, and they had this big fight. And it was to and fro in the press until she had to give it up in the end because he was rich and he was very litigious. And a libel case he took back then in the early 1820s was only repealed in 2013 by case by Google. So they had to let go. So that was one thing. She didn't die. She did lose the baby, though. It's very sad. Queen Victoria's coronation, 1838. Off she goes. Down she comes. She hits hits off a coping stone. There's a huge crowd there, including this young man up from Devon who grabs the tow rope, hits a coping stone, hits him on the head, goes off. He takes two weeks to die. Now, you can't kind of laughed that off, there was an inquest. And um, the balloon was named a deodand, which is an instrument of death. It's a very strange, antiquated verdict. So it kind of was her fault, but she didn't really get called for it. So she, she always said that um, he was drunk and she told him not to grab the what they rope. And anyway, had a skin infection. I think the inquest said, no, I think it's a large brick that hit him on the head. <laughs> Your balloon that killed him. So then, my favourite, 1851, the Great Exhibition, Crystal Palace, huge, beautiful building made of glass. I mean, someone's Christmas. taking a risk in this booking. Yes. Why would you have Mrs Graham anyway? What do you not want to see when you look up through the glass building? <laughs> Mrs Graham, no, no. <laughs> she's hurtling towards him, looks like she's going to crash, throws all the ballast out, hits the roof. They just knock off a flagpole and they sort of swerve. She doesn't crash into the Crystal Palace, but she does crash into the roof of a maid of a chap in Piccadilly. Crash, all the chimneys come down. They're all, her and her husband are found looking very dead on the rooftops. £300 worth of damage. But again, she wasn't dead. She was taken home. And she always had the pressmen in. She got on really well with them. And she'd tell them her tale before she collapsed back to recover. <laughs> And she did, she had these sort of epic arguments with other people through the press. So yeah. she, Letitia Sage wrote her memoirs, but she, um, she she sort of waged war with people through the letters pages until editors of newspapers told them to stop, um, to stop doing it. She's a real hero as well because she never let herself be libeled. She always said, no, this happened, this happened, this happened. And she was terrible for telling tall tales. But at the core of what she said was, no, this is not what happened. This is what happened. And the press loved her because she was friends with them. And I think that kind of celebrity then, it's quite interesting to see how the press loved her, so she loved them. The editors always let her, if there was some crash, which was going in as a news item, she would literally rear up, write her letter, and she'd get it to the paper so that it would run under the news. <laughs> so, I know that was bad, but let me explain. <laughs> And also, it's a life motto. I know it looks bad, but let me explain. <laughs> Don't start. <laughs> this chap who started writing in, and he was attacking. It's, it's called Mrs. Graham again. So when, and, and he just lists all the things she's done, and she's quite annoyed that he says she killed two people because she only killed one. You know, come on. <laughs> but she rears up and she writes a really articulate letter saying. This happens a lot to wear or Why do you only attack me? It's because I'm a female. Mm-hmm. She makes a really impassioned argument for that. And then later, when he does it again, later in her career, what I really like is that Henry Coxwell, who was the famous aeronaut, who was deleted from the recent film, The Aeronauts, and replaced with 
Felicity Jones. <laughs> he's a great, but he was a great hero. And he wrote a very lovely, reasoned, comradely defence of her in the same paper and said, again, why are you attacking her? It seems like you're just waiting for her to come along and then you're just kicking her when she's down, you know. She's no better or worse than any aeronaut. And what you're saying is that flying is dangerous. Well, yeah, no one's saying it isn't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was terrifically dangerous, um, which is the fact that she flew for such a long time is remarkable. It wasn't just the, the French and the British that were Skylarking in Cloudland. That is my favourite name for a book, uh, Skylarking in Cloudland. Um, but that was that was the American aeronauts, wasn't it? Which gets you back to your riots. Yes, well, I'm still on a mission to try and get more attention to Madame Johnson, who was the first woman to fly from American soil, and she did it in 1825 from the Battery, New York. I don't know if you've been to New York, but sort of down on the waterfront. It used to be like an old fort. Well, not then. <laughs> a new fort then to fight. <laughs> they should have never turned up, but they didn't. And... She's made it, and there's huge, huge pomp and ceremony around her ascent. She took off, she was very elegant. She came down on um, Brooklyn Beach and then she came back by horse and cart and there was a big party. Then, four years later, she pops up again, three years later rather, and she causes a riot on Broadway, which is hilarious. Again, <laughs> Nibblers was this garden on Broadway, Proto Broadway, it's already a sort of entertainment district big garden again and um, the balloon won't rise there often was a problem either with the gas supply or the fabric of the balloon or the weather conditions very prayer to the weather and for whatever reason she couldn't get in the balloon so as always happened there was a riot because people were drinking and milling about and if the balloon didn't go up there was a huge instead. number of the people there as well weren't there hundreds of thousands of people I don't think we can conceive about what big deal this was there had never been crowds before the Montgolfiers started drawing them in from um, Paris onwards anyway the police had to come and she had to be um, they had to hold back the rioting crowd and she had to make her escape <laughs> it turns up in Philadelphia literally weeks later and we think as far as I could tell she's a widow with children again there's this very snooty male account of her taking off and he said oh isn't it sad that she has to do this and there's no indication at all that she found it sad. She was a very, very skilled aeronaut, making a very interesting life from being an aeronaut. Anyway, she went on strike. Philadelphia, all the town worthies there, huge crowds, and she said, you're paying me less than it's costing me to do it. I'm not going up until you raise my wages. <laughs> it wouldn't go up. And she won it. She won the pay rise, and now she went. And that was really significant. And then there were ballooning women all through American history. They, it became, the Americans loved it. it I think it, because he was born in Paris in 1783, when some of the founding fathers, fathers were there, signing the Treaty of Paris, it was all bound up with that sense of freedom and innovation and new worlds, wasn't it? Mm. So, and women really were able to take advantage of that because mm. the equality they couldn't find on the ground, they did find in the sky. Um, even winning equal pay or better pay. Well, that's it. Or pay. <laughs> yeah, pay. <laughs> but that's that was what increasingly, as I drew the narrative together of my book and all these stories. So I mean, talk about an embarrassment of riches from nobody knew about them too. Well, there's her and there was her, and it's not just a, a talk. It's not just about balloons. It's incredible social history, adventure stories, tragedies, triumphs, and what. I kept thinking back, thinking too was, this is a frontier of female freedom that I've never heard discussed. You know, nobody thought to ban them. Women were banned from anything fun, weren't they? But nobody ever got round. In those Wild West days of early ballooning, if you had the gumption and a balloon, off you went. And also that, like we've talked about, that showbiz aspect. A, a feisty uh, female aeronaut was a crowd puller and they, they made the most of that. So they found a freedom in the air that was literally nowhere on the ground. And in all their accounts, it's very telling, I think, that they all talk about that sense of freedom and emancipation and limitless boundaries. Because, as we know, I mean, you had literally no rights on the ground at the time, did you? 
Exactly. And which is and the fact that so many of them be, were writers because they wrote about their extraordinary experience. Um, it that's why you have such a, a kind of rich um, resource to try to try and uh, unpick their stories. Um, but I do wonder if that might also be why they faded from history, because you got they, they were when they were back on the ground, they were women writers and they so their works faded away along with their achievements. I think so, and because, because I'm a journalist, I absolutely love looking at the um, the press record, and a lot of that doesn't endure, does it, unless you go looking for it. But like you say, Mrs. Graham in particular, and lots of them gave interviews at the time, or were quoted in in um, received speech or whatever. But yes, they were so transient, weren't they? Their mm-hmm. achievements were transient because they're events. Their accounts of what happened were transient because they're often in the press, or like you say, very small publishers. Or they weren't asked. Yeah. So the fact that there is so much to be found, so many first person accounts in these women, I think absolutely helped bring it alive for me. And also this sense when you're writing women's history, especially forgotten women's history, I think it's very easy to fall into that sort of trope of they were all victims, all the men were oppressing. Not really, not in these stories. Quite often there were very, very equal partnerships. Mr. and Mrs. Graham in particular were really, they were business partners and it was a love match and they were a team. And, and she grew really, longer than he did. Yeah, and she looked after him. He was a bit older than her. Yeah. And he was into the occult, wasn't he? I want to look more into that, actually. He wrote a book <laughs> on the occult and witchcraft. <laughs> Venus of <laughs> love. <laughs> I think an evening round their house would have been, uh, would have been hilarious. Um, just to finish we I said you came to Chorlton that the the first time to talk about something completely different yeah. um, because Lady Aeronauts is one area of expertise um, but the others is the other is the Brontes and particularly Mrs Bronte um, so and that I love the fact that you were able to tell it's a story none of us knew you were able to tell us when we were t- we were saying what's um what we were going to do with the special exhibition and you said well, you must include the lady Erin or you must include Mrs Sage um that collab that happenstance and collaboration is is wonderful because it's taken you Chawton House the National Aerospace Library um it's brought us together in a way that we would we would not have known each other existed and I think that's certainly something in the in the lockdown and with us all doing a lot more online um, and certainly doing this festival that it is bringing people together who otherwise wouldn't have um, been aware of what of what other people were doing um Lunar Mania Bells is you can buy it um but you're also I've got a paperback version coming out next year yeah, but that's um, way off. You get that. That's on order at the minute. Offer rather at my publisher, Pen and Sword. Fabulous. Um, especially because it's um, uh, we do sell it in our shop, and our shop's not open at the moment. So, Pen and Sword Publishers for Balloonomania Bells. It is a riotous read, um, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed. It made the first two weeks of lockdown. It was just I sat in the balcony out in my in my flat here, just hooting away at some of the stories, but some of them are just so inspirational as well, and just a, a whole world historical um, subject that that I knew nothing about. Um, Sharon, you're going to join us um, on our social media asking asking authors with the hashtag uh, Chorlton Lit Fest um, oh, yeah. after this has been. Uh, uh, pu- uh, has been broadcast <laughs> so join us over on uh, on our twitter uh, feed now to ask sharon more about the lady aeronauts but thank you so much sharon um, and hopefully we can have you back at Chorton house very very soon i look forward to it thank you bye